Hello everyone! I thought it was time to go back and look at another Transformer toy line no one really talks about anymore. Unless, of course, a brand new Black Optimus Prime comes out and then it's the word that everybody is speaking. And by word, I mean three words. Robots in disguise. This was the 2001 Transformer toy line in America, born from car robots out in Japan. And it's a weird line when you think about it because we view it as filler. Because essentially, in America, that's exactly what it was. However, to look at the bigger picture, it actually did a lot for the brand. And it introduced a lot of conventions that we kind of take for granted now. So, before we begin... Let's go into a little bit of the background information behind the show and the series itself, and we'll just kind of look at the history really quick. So for starters, we have to look at the American side of things. Beast Wars did great, so they followed it up with Beast Machines, which is, you know, much more high-concept series than Beast Wars was. It didn't go well. Uh, toy sales weren't great, viewership for the cartoon wasn't great, and because of that, we missed out on a series called Trans Tech, which we got to talk about at some point down the line, too. But point is, a sequel series was planned for Beast Machines that got canceled because of the low performance of the toys. In fact, there were several toys produced for Beast Machines that never made it to retailers because by then the show was and the toy line was pretty much DOA. You know, at that point, it was easier to just, you know, show like cut it off before any more tooling got made, which would just be more expensive and cost Hasbro more money. Meanwhile, on the Japanese side of things, Beast Wars 2 and Beast Wars Neo didn't really perform the way Takara wanted. The sales were lacking in both series, and Beast Wars Neo especially kind of brought everything down, and they were kind of at a point of desperation. What we got as Robots in Disguise, they had as Car Robots, which was rumored at one time to be Transformers 2000. And no, it was never called that. It was always called Car Robots, which is a reference to Car Robo, the subline from Diaclone that actually gave us most of the original Transformers line. It was the very first time that Transformers in any generation try to throw back to the classics and the originals to try and capture on nostalgia. Now, at that point, the original show is about 15 years old, so you hope that you hit that demographic that is now the young adult with, exp with spendable income. But the truth is, that really only hits when you're, when you're at an age where you're passing things down to your own kids. So it's usually like 20 years after. So it was, a little, it was still a little bit too young, at least in Japan, to play on nostalgia. So Car Robots also did not do well. After this, Takara would actually shelve Transformers for a year while they re-strategized. The rumor for years was that this was basically the last hurrah of Transformers before they shelved it for an indeterminate amount of time until Hasbro talked them into doing a collaborative effort to create a new toy line that would work for both American and Japanese audiences. I don't know how much uh, confirmation there is behind that, but for whatever reason, that's exactly what happened, and that's where Armada comes from. However, Hasbro is not willing to let one failure stop it and wasn't letting... Uh, wasn't willing to let a year go by without Transformer product on the shelves. So, Robots in Disguise becomes a thing. It's a quick, cheap dub of the cartoon, uh, yeah, given in the style of like TV anime of the early 2000s. And most of those new toys coming over from Japan, mostly untouched. You know, basically just repackaged in American packaging, given new names, and kind of pushed out the door. So, uh, there was a lot of different things that were going on with that, and we're going to cover that. The sh just to briefly touch on it, the show itself, it's, I don't know, the show itself is, un un is like, not spectacular. Let's call it that way. It's unimpressive to me. It's a pretty typical plot. There's nothing, like, really, you know, like, complex or really that deep about it. It's just, you know, 
Predacons, you know, or I guess uh, Predacons trying to defeat Autobots, and, and then later on Decepticons get into the mix. Things like Scourge make things a little bit more interesting. The fight over Fortress Maximus makes things a little bit more interesting. But overall, it's on the lower end of Transformer shows for me. But that's not what we're really here to talk about. We are here to talk about the toy line. And the toy line was fascinating. So it starts with Optimus Prime, the return of Optimus Prime. The first time America had seen him since Machine Wars. And the first time he had gotten a completely new mold since the, the, the end of G and since like the end of G1 with like the Action Master. This was a very big departure. Optimus Prime was always a semi truck. Now he's a fire truck, which makes sense for a heroic character. So good on them. Uh, it was also the first time since uh, also the first time since Power Master Optimus Prime that we had an Optimus with a super mode which was a really, really cool one. Everyone loved this toy. Like, this was, like, the toy to get in that entire series. Very, very good toy. I think this is the one that people wishes they would redo the most out of anything in R.I.D. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it was great to see Optimus Prime back again. You know, classic fans ate it up. Of course they did. And, you know... American kids like, you know, kids like fire trucks. You know, that's always been a thing for in America as well. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of a perfect mix. And meanwhile, uh, R.I.D. also introduced to us uh, the concept of a renegade Autobot, which you kind of got in the comic books with Grimlock, but this was the first time in animation. So Ultra Magnus was kind of our first bad boy Autobot, or Autobot with a chip on his shoulder, something along that vein. It was the first time since God Jinrai that Optimus Prime had a character that combined with him to create a brand new super mode. Keep in mind, America never got a uh, God Bomber, which means in America, this was the very first time Optimus ever combined with anyone, which does make it a really cool piece. And yeah, it makes it gives it a little place in Transformer history, at least American Transformer history. You know, now, what was weird about this toy line is that because it is Japanese-focused toy line, there were only so many new molds created. Remember, they were kind of in a recovery period. They were trying to produce a new toy line without going too hot, far over budget. So in, our, in Car Robots, only 11 new toys were created, and almost all of them were Autobots. Only one was not. But what they did with their brand new Autobots was at least interesting. I should say uh, Cybertron, so we're talking the Japanese version. For, for instance, we got Combiners back. And the first one we did was Rail Racer. And everyone loved Rail Racer. This is probably one of the cleanest Combiners we ever got. Apparently, these sold so badly that Hasbro had to come out and say, we are never reissuing or redoing these again. <laughs> So, I uh, hope you got them back in 2001, because uh, we're not going to get them again, most likely. And I don't really foresee them making a brand new version. This is one of the rare times when the American version actually did better than the Japanese version, because they swapped out a lot of the opaque plastic for solid, which meant it was far sturdier than the Japanese version, which, of course, I absolutely love to hear. It also allowed them to paint all the windows individually, which, for me, looked a lot nicer than, like, the super dark translucent windows. It didn't really look right on a bullet train. But we one-upped it. We had to look at the build team in Landfill, where this... Okay, so we got a construction team. But again, it's a unique combiner. Only four components. I don't believe Transformers had a four-component combiner before this. Three? Yes. Five and six? Yes. I want to say this is the first four. This one in particular is also really unique because it was the first time you could actually switch who was what part without actually dismantling the combiner. You had to retransform the limbs, but uh, your centerpiece wedge would actually rotate in the core and the others rotated around his back and any of them could form two sets of arms and any of them could form a leg. It's a really brilliant piece of engineering. I can all, all I... 
a lot of what I remember about landfill and the reaction people had back in the day was the toy itself and the gimmick was really cool. Why is Wedge so expensive and a delu as a deluxe when he's so much smaller than anybody else? These days we have Cliff Jumper. We have Cliff Jumper in uh, in our toy lines, so uh, we where well now nah, that's kind of like an old hat thing at this point. But again, a really unique set of toys, really unique. And then of course there is Gigatron himself, or a, just another Megatron in America. They went all out on this one. They were only doing one new Decepticon slash Predacon slash Death Stronger. Because we had that term introduced to us. And they went all out with it. They decided to up six shot. This one had six forms. And then when it got repainted, it got retooled to accommodate for four more. And then there's an official 11th mode done after the show by the designer. Uh, and then, of course, there's the plethora of fan modes the toy is capable of. I think this one is easy to find very, very loose very very often because transform you're basically like just to see everything it does you're putting 10 times the wear and tear on it getting from all the different modes and back but it was a really good test of your memory in order to like correctly transform all 10 modes also the american version got the retooled version of gigatron meaning our megatron could form all 10 modes when the japanese one couldn't I pointed out in a previous video, one of the rare times an American toy was better than Takara's version. And then you had the Autobot Brothers. I feel like the Deluxe Brothers is really where you saw the most of the previous design style. Beast Wars 2 and Beast Wars Neo's unique molds, especially Neo, had a really bad habit of relying a lot on shell kibble, hiding a robot inside the beast mode, and I feel like that shows a lot in some of their and some of the Autobot brothers. I mean, uh, Mock Alert slash Prowl probably handles it best, but then you've got X Brawn who has a lot of panels hanging off of him. He's not terrible though. Sideburn, oh yeah, Sideburn was a mess. Uh, I think. This is one of the most infamous, difficult to transform Transformers because he's just so pointlessly overcomplicated in his engineering, which is pretty astonishing given that half of his vehicle just kind of hangs off of him in extra chunks. Not even that, more than half. It hangs off his hips, it hangs off his back, it hangs off his arm, it's his gun. I don't think we ever figured out why Sideburn was so pointlessly complicated. But again, this establishes something new in Transformers the idea of repainting a character into the same character, either as a covert version, or in this case, a powered up version. The idea that one mold can represent different paint jobs of the same character that exist for different reasons, rather than creating a brand new toy. That, again, something new introduced to Transformers thanks to R.I.D. But everything after that, keep in mind, there was only 11 new molds. Everything after that had to be done in repaints, and obviously the most famous one is Scourge, or Black Convoy. Obviously the most popular. Obviously. Uh, the black, the teal, everything worked so well on this to create just such a memorable deco that we're still trying to get more toys of it to this day. And yeah, uh, this is kind of the trend that followed with R.I.D. They went back to G1 and got the Combaticons back. You know, we, where we ended up getting, of course, uh, Valdigus in Japan, Ruination over here, and then a plethora of repaints because Hasbro just could not let it die. It is an example of the store exclusive, which does exist back in G1 as well, but R.I.D. is what really established store exclusive Transformers as a thing in America. Uh, it's, one, it's one of the rare times where I can remember I have to go to this store if I want Scourge. I have to go to Walmart if I want, you know, like the the all the urban camo ruination. So a lot more toy hunting happened because of R.I.D. And it actually, exclusives are not always a bad thing because it lets things get to market that otherwise the market would skip. So don't pander them immediately. You know, they actually exist for a reason. We also got 
If it, if it, G1, so we pull, let's, yes. This toy line was so weird. It pulled from literally everything it could. You know, the the rest of the Destrongers was made up of Transmetal 2 toys that never came out in Japan. The We got uh, reuses of the G2 GoBots as Spy Changers. And this became so popular that we don't even think of them as the G2 GoBots anymore. I think we default to Spy Changers as what we describe them as. We love the term Spy Changers so much that we applied it to later figures released in that size that weren't actually Spy Changers. But for whatever reason, it's stuck. And it's one of the things from R.I.D. that still continues to roll on. And it's fun, and I hope to see a few more someday, but man... <laughs> It's a random thing that, like, repaints of G2 GoBots ended up being something the fans clung to. And then we get to things like Skybite. I said it in a past video. This is the best repaint Transformers has ever done. And the fact that the American one actually covers a little bit more than the Japanese one, again, is kind of impressive. It's a beautiful job, and I think the perfection of the Transmetal 2 design, I wish every Transmetal 2 got this treatment. Man. So, even though this toy line was repetitive, and did rely a lot on retools and remolds, it did so with gusto, and did so with a bit of bravery that we hadn't seen before, producing some really classic designs and really cool new paint jobs for old toys. It also presented Hasbro a way of getting more figures that got canceled from Beast Machines out on American shelves. So here's the thing. In Japan, even car robots didn't really do that well. But in America, it kind of boomed interest again. Kind of helped by the fact that the anime came out at a time when anime was banging in America. You know, And they got on the Fox Kids block on Saturday mornings. Everyone wanted to be on that block. Which just means you've got more and more opportunity to do more. And that means more and more product needs to be produced to fill demand. So R.I.D. went from releasing this Japanese toy line and all the different repaints it created to releasing its own repaints and using molds that it never used before. Spy changers that came out in... Uh, the spy changers that uh, never came out uh, in G2... We're now a thing. Remember how I said spy changes were just a thing? My brain defaulted to that. GoBot molds that were never released in G2 came out as new spy changers. Hasbro would uh, go on to release more Beast Machines molds that never got released, like Megabolt Megatron and Air Attack Optimus Primal. We got, uh, we got repaints of Beast Machines toys in multi-packs and singles. That's another thing I didn't even touch on, is that R.I.D. introduced the idea of multi-pack figures as well. Spy Changers were packed two per, uh, two per box. And then uh, for the Mega Class, you could have one larger figure inside or three smaller Basic Class figures. The Deluxe Class was, was uh, patterned out with some like normal Deluxes and then some two-pack. It was an interesting time. It was kind of a Wild West time to see how things kind of got packed together. Now, of course, it's not the first multi-pack we ever saw. Be Beast Wars did it as their preview pack of Optimus and Megatron. But this is the first time it became a regular thing. And it was very common to see multi-packs around this era. But man, it was just a landscape for Hasbro to basically just do whatever. Whether, you know, however many figures it took to fill out a price point, pack them in. Whatever paint job we kind of want to do, do it. What molds do we have lying around? Let's release them. What molds didn't we get a chance to repaint before? Let's repaint them. You know, when I talk Wild West, that's basically what it was. And R.I.D. in America did so well that eventually Hasbro started making brand new molds for it. Suddenly, this toy line that was supposed to be filler, it was supposed to just bridge the gap between Beast Machines and Armada, just put new product on the shelf, was suddenly in demand enough that Hasbro felt the need to make more. We got Spy Changer, Optimus, and Magnus. They didn't combine, they didn't have their smaller modes in Prime's case, but... We called them Spy Changer because they were the small size. They're not Spy Changers. Let's get real. But that's what I mean. Like, 
brand new toys started coming out alongside all these repaints. Only a few, don't get me wrong, this is still a cheap line, but it shows just how well R.I.D. was actually doing to an impressive degree, to the point where when Armada came out, Transformers actually had an air of momentum to it that it had lost from Beast Machines. Since then, the representation for Robots in Disguise is pretty limited. You get the occasional throwback to Fire Convoy uh, or Ultra Magnus in the Siege line. You get a brand new Skybite here and there. I think he is the character that's progressed. Sometimes I think even more so than Black Convoy because the dub of Skybite, because the dub was inaccurate, by the way, made him so much more fun and endearing as a character. So I like that he lives on amongst all things. And of course, there are things like Rail Racer, uh, the Fire Convoy style, uh, Landfill Team, Spy Changers, the fans still tend to latch onto and hope to see return someday. You know, and we've, we're in the middle of a legacy trilogy that can do whatever, so who knows? But that is your overview of Transformers Robots in Disguise 2001. For something that was supposed to be a filler, it very may well have saved interest in Transformers and got a lot of collectors back into it. I think a lot of collectors just really like to see Autobot and Decepticon logos again. Let's be real here. But that that is the history of R.I.D. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane. I'm sure some of you watching might be too young to have experienced this toy line. It's worth going back and checking out because it's a fascinating period in Transformer history. And for those who have been around this franchise long enough, Man, do you remember how crazy it was trying to, like, go around town, trying to track down, of all things, in the year 2001, the G1 Combaticons? As a, that, is, that is an excursion I will personally never forget. But thank you for joining me. I hope to see you next time. Guys, I am facing the most powerful enemy any YouTuber can face, the algorithm, and I need your help to defeat him. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment. Every time you do, we attack that algorithm and we drive it back until it can no longer defeat this channel. Thank you very much.